Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Welcome to this Zwerf Buffy Bocconi e lecture on global trends in climate litigation 2023 snapshot. A couple of years ago, I watched a science fiction movie in which citizens sued governments and big companies for destroying the Earth's climate and nature. This is about five years ago that I saw this on the TV. And I was quite impressed. I remembered this movie when a few months ago, I read in an Austrian newspaper an article about a team of LSE researchers who just published an overview of the current state of climate litigation globally. Now, as I, as an economist, I needed to check on Google what litigation exactly means. And I thought this is interesting for the Swerf audience. And I wrote to you too. And fortunately, you agreed to uh, present your work to us. Because indeed, climate litigation, that is legal action against corporate firms or governments who are accused of failing to set action needed to mitigate climate change. This is what I found as a definition. So climate litigation has become quite widespread recently. Sometimes what appeared to be science fiction a short while ago it turns into reality faster than expected. Now, we are happy to have with us today the authors of this study. We have excellent discussions and uh, most of all, we are privileged uh, to have Chiara Ciglioli, General Counsel of the ECB and Professor at Goethe University to keep the whole thing together and keep it organized. So without further ado, I may hand over to you, dear Chiara. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your very kind words. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, we, uh, we have this, uh, Ernest and I met many, many years ago and regularly we meet uh, in some uh, conference of uh, very high interest. So thank you, first of all, to Surf and to Buffy Bo uh, Bocconi for the incredible job in organizing this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, on top of it, on a topic which uh, for me is extremely stimulating. Um, a warm welcome to all the participants online. I understand there are several, uh, a couple of hundred people that have registered. And indeed, it is uh, worth being here because uh, we have a, a fantastic panel and an interesting topic. Uh, climate litigation is an increasingly complex and fast evolving topic, and this is why it's good to keep uh, on track uh, with it. And we will benefit today from the insight and the experience of uh, two outstanding researchers uh, here with us, uh, Joanna Setzer and Catherine Higgin. Joanna is an is assistant professorial research uh, fellow at LSE, Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment is a very long title, but uh, it is important enough because uh, it is the best uh, and largest database on climate policy legislation and litigation of the world. She holds a PhD in Environment and Development from the LSE and also served as a British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow. And she has been in the Grantham Research Institute since 2013, but she now also heads it. And Catherine is a policy fellow at the same Grantham Research Institute for Climate Change Laws of the World. And previously, she uh, contributed significantly to the work of the Carbon Disclosure Project, which is a non-profit organization helping states, public authorities, companies and investors across the world to announce their environmental disclosures. And also dedicated many years uh, to a related topic, I would say, but very important topic, human rights cases in South, East, uh, South Asia and Middle East. Joanna and Catherine are here because uh, along with the Climate Change Laws of the World Project, they collaborate every year on issuing a report on global trends in climate change litigation. This is the fifth edition this year, and they will present that to us today. Um, now, you will ask why uh, does uh, Ernest bother about that and why do you care about, about this topic? Uh, what is uh, the relevance for central bank supervisors and financial institution of climate change? Well, let me explain. So at the ECB, we started collaborating with John and Catherine in 2021 uh, when they presented to us uh, a paper uh, on climate change litigation and central bank in a legal colloquium we had organized. And we had organized a legal colloquium because in 2021, 
the network uh, for greening the financial system launch a, a legal task force bringing together legal experts from central banks and financial authorities across the world and then publish a first report on climate litigation in 2021 so of course we um, did benefit enormously from the work and the presentation that Jan and Katrin did to us at the time. Now, in 2022, the task force was transformed into a stable forum, the NGFS Expert Network on Legal Issues, that I have the honor to chair. And in September, uh, the NGFS published two further reports on the topic of climate litigation, on which I will say nothing, because we have with us uh, one of the uh, discussants, Jean Boissino, who will talk about that later. So um, the work of Joanna and Catherine really has uh, been extremely helpful for our analysis. Now, let me introduce the three discussants. We have three excellent discussants for having an animated uh, conversation today. First, uh, Jean, uh, I just mentioned Jean Bersino. Jean is the Secretary General of the uh, Au Conseil de Stabilité Financière, uh, which is the French Macroprudential Authority. And he is also the head of the Secretariat of NGFS, uh, hosted by Banque de France. And we are very grateful in the uh, legal network to Jean and his team, because they have been really instrumental for bringing the lawyers into this topic and ensuring also the publication of the various reports that have been prepared on climate litigation that I was mentioning before. Then uh, we have Bernard de Longevieille. Uh, he is the global head of sustainable finance of um, uh, Standard & Poor's Global Ratings, and he leads the SMP Global Rating Sustainable Finance Strategy with regard both to uh, sustainable finance products, uh, such as second party opinion, green valuation, and ESG valuation, uh, as well as also credit rating. So he has uh, uh, quite an exposure on this type of uh, securities and assessment of the security. And third, we are joined by uh, Alex Lombos. And Alex is a lawyer at the environmental NGO Client Earth that is quite uh, known. Uh, they are very active. Uh, and uh, he focuses on accountable finance. And he was uh, his work including developing legal strategies to reduce um, the climate impact of the banking sector, greening central bank policy, and uh, the activities of the public financial uh, institution, public sector financial institution. So we really have three different angles that will be able to um, uh, interact with uh, Joanna and Catherine uh, later on. So the plan today is to first give the floor to uh, Joanna and Catherine to present their paper. Thereafter, we will have a round of discussion with the discussant. So each discussant will take the floor to um, well comment or add, complement what has been said. Uh, John and Catherine will have an opportunity to replicate to that uh, after every intervention. And at the very end, we will open the floor for uh, a, an open discussion. So, Joanna, Catherine, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ernest, and thank you, Chiara, for this introduction. And it, it's great you gave some context on how uh, you, uh, through your work at the ECB and SWEF, got involved uh, with climate litigation because it, as we were talking just before the start of this it was when we started our uh, work collecting analyzing cases we were not expecting we would be ending uh, ended up having these conversations with central banks and of course the the, the, the field has grown and it's become more and more important as uh, both uh, there is an, a direct interest from banks, but also an, an indirect uh, interest from the regulators in 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 uh, reduce hopefully this uh, risk of litigation and understand the field. So it's it's great that uh, we have this interest. That we really appreciate the uh, invitation and and commend the the work of the ECB uh, with its publications and uh, more generally of the NHS. NGFS. Um, so very good. I don't want to take long uh, saying thank you. Uh, I hope that's clear that we are grateful, but we have a lot to cover. And the way we want to do this is that Kate and I will share the presentation into uh, two halves. Uh, the first half I will present uh, bringing you um, uh, uh, 
basically this overview of what is happening in climate litigation, so the growth of cases, and also how uh, litigation has become uh, a governance tool. And uh, I will mention a few cases, a few strategies, and um, then Kate will follow with an, uh, basically an analysis of the outcomes implications of litigation and finishing uh, with a consideration about some of the, the new recent and forthcoming legislative developments. So 12 minutes for each and hopefully you have a good understanding of what is happening in the world of climate litigation. Um, I'm going to share my slides because we have a few graphs that might be of interest and um, uh, before I, I, I really go into this, just uh, to uh, say where the source of a lot of what I'm going to say, uh, what the source is, the global trend in climate litigation report that we publish every year, Chiara mentioned, uh, is uh, definitely uh, the, the source of a lot of what we say here and of um, uh, you, you can already imagine that um, in the future we'll continue having that. So I always uh, would invite colleagues to look at previous years and then uh, follow with our next uh, snapshots sh shots in 2024. Uh, this is the fifth edition, but uh, we also already invite you to, uh, if you haven't already come across our climate laws of the world database, a database of all the climate laws and policies, so executive and legislative um, that we maintain and have uh, in our um, here for free and openly accessible to all. So let me kick off with the graph that maybe you already saw, but I want to emphasize a few points here in this graph. So the graph clearly shows that climate litigation is growing every year. It shows a few more things. It shows the total number, of course, um, it, that we have already collected and uh, that we are aware of. It's over 2,340 cases. Now, what's interesting here is that you can see in the graph that it, it is a very uh, timid phenomenon until the 2015 uh, Paris Agreement landmark there, where over two thirds of the cases have been identified since. So it's a recent growth. And also you can see from the two colors that it has uh, been a very US dominated phenomenon, but that is growing across the world. So um, we, we see this spread not only in the global north, but also in the global south. And so far, what we can see here is that 2021 has been the highest annual number of cases. But of course, this is something that is uh, that might change because we constantly discover, come across new cases. And this is uh, a work that our colleagues at the Sabin Center at Columbia University uh, are uh, leading, collecting the cases and making them available in this database with the collaboration of many other partners, including us at the Grantham. So, the 1st point, hopefully is clear. It's raising, it's expanding and it's recent. Now, just to say that it's growing is probably a very, um, uh, it doesn't tell you the whole story. And I think the story that we're interested in here is one of how climate litigation started being used as a governance tool. So, um, in, in for many years, the courts were not thought as as one of the tools for governance. And if you look at the IPCC, which is the most authoritative um, analysis of the current state of the science and what exists to address the problem, you see that it was in the latest assessment report, the one that was published in 2022, that for the first time, climate litigation was recognized as a, uh, a tool that can shape governance. And, uh, and and this is something that you, you find in the report. So along the report, there are over a hundred um, times that you find the, the, the word climate litigation. If you search, there's a whole section on uh, some of the cases and some of the trends. So this is all very important, but also the fact that climate litigation in this sentence that uh, it, it can uh, affect the outcome and the ambition of climate governance made it all the way to the summary for policymakers. So a document that is approved by representatives from every country. Um, so every member government would have now accepted that 
uh, that there is an important role in uh, litigating. However, when we look at the type of uh, strategies and we try to identify the key strategies that are uh, driving this, this increasing numbers, we see that yes, the majority of the cases are aligned with climate. So they're trying to seek more ambition from governments. They're trying to increase accountability from corporates, but there are also other types of cases. And this is where we talk about the non-aligned uh, climate litigation, so the, the litigation that might be trying to to challenge uh, policies, to maybe delay action, or uh, uh, you know similar types of uh, cases that are targeted at individuals, and we call these slaps. So you can see here we have a, a small box for these non-aligned cases, and we also have a box for what we are calling just transition litigation. A and these cases are really uh, cases that I would say translate the complexity of addressing climate change through law, in the sense that you would have laws that are trying to raise ambition and to, uh, you have problems projects and policies to expand the use of renewables. And sometimes these might affect the rights of populations that are already vulnerable, that are already suffering. So you would have cases where these new technologies, developments, laws are being challenged, not because uh, you would have a major lobby from an oil company, but you have communities that are suffering with, say, the mining of lithium or uh, with the installation of power plants, um, uh, energy um, from solar and wind that haven't been consulted or participated in the processes. So we also acknowledge that there is a, a likelihood that these cases will increase and they basically translate the complexity of addressing climate change. But we want to focus here in the largest box that you can see the yellow one where there are different types of strategies of climate aligned cases. And in particular, we'll look at cases against governments and cases against corporates. So um, the, the first type of high profile, uh, high visibility case against governments that I think it's important to understand is this uh, we call in our report government framework cases. Some people refer to these as systemic litigation or uh, to those who are familiar with some of the cases, the agenda style litigation. So agenda, the case that really started uh, to to um, be uh, written in by journalists. So the, the first one that probably reached the headlines, uh, the first time that a government was told to increase its ambition and uh, have more ambitious reduction targets. So following the Urgenda case, we have now identified over 80 of this type of cases that either seek more ambition, so the, the example um, we saw of Urgenda, but also many cases that seek the implementation of existing targets, existing legislation. And these cases have been filed now all around the world. Um, we, we see uh, an increase after, uh, of course, these successful cases where th the idea will travel to other countries where, well, if a case was successful in Holland, if it was su successful in Germany, maybe there's a chance that it will be successful el elsewhere, but always the case is adapted to different realities, jurisdictions, legislation. So, um, many of these cases have already reached Supreme Courts, and it's interesting, for instance, that out of nine cases that have reached Supreme Courts, seven have been successful. So, these cases have reached a, a considerable high rate of success, deter then determining that governments have to raise their ambition or uh, implement existing policies. Now, the last type of uh, cases that I want to mention is the cases against corporates. And here we have different types of cases that sometimes the strategies might overlap. So the initial uh, type that most people would think of is this, uh, the more classic polluters pay, the idea that the companies that have been polluting or emitting in this case should pay, should compensate for damages suffered by communities and individuals. And here we see also a development in the early cases that have been uh, largely unsuccessful to current cases that are ongoing with 
many would say uh, a possibility of seeing success a lot to do with also not only a, a, an increasing in awareness but also development in the science in the science of uh, accounting for emissions and the science of attribution so uh, we have examples uh, here as the recent one, Asmania versus Holcim, a case that was brought by a group of islanders in Indonesia against Holcim, the cement company in Switzerland. So these cases might also have this transnational aspect where the case is brought uh, in a different country, but also represents uh, the uh, climate un injustices of um, this issue. The cases uh, that we uh, call framework cases are a sort of an extension to the, those framework cases we saw against governments where you seek more ambition, you seek the alignment with the Paris Agreement, so an alignment with the 1.5 uh, ambition, and th that, uh, th that uh, aim is brought from states to corporates. So the idea that corporates also have a duty of care, that corporates have to align their um, trajectories, their emissions with the Paris Agreement. And this is uh, the very important landmark case you might have heard about uh, in the Milieu Defensive versus Shell, also in the Netherlands, where there's been a, a decision by the same district court of The Hague that initially gave a decision in the Agenda case in favor of that reduction across scopes one, two, and three. So this has been very significant, and we've, we've seen also new cases emerging in other countries using similar types of uh, strategies. Now, the turning off the TAPS cases uh, are cases that are of particular interest to the finance world because these are cases that are seeking to uh, challenge the financing of uh, activities. So the finance of oil and gas um, to the financing of activities that lead to deforestation. And finally, these cases that get a lot of visibility and that we have seen also some success, the climate washing cases that challenge the um, communications, advertisement campaigns, how companies have uh, portrayed their products as being carbon neutral, net zero, or uh, relying on technologies that don't exist currently. To finish, I just want to say that we have observed this interesting uh, trend here where initially the litigation was against corporates and against a small group of companies that are the uh, major emitters, the oil and gas companies. And you can see here in the graph, the three colors in 2015 and how ha this has changed more recently with really a growth in the number of sectors involved. And, and this is where we see uh, the, the banking, the insurance, the financial services, and also other companies that wouldn't be your uh, usual suspects. And uh, that, that includes in the food and textiles and travel uh, sectors being also uh, involved in litigation. Some of this is to do with the climate washing cases that, of course, have challenged many of the communications of companies that are trying to, to be more environmentally friendly in their um, aims. Uh, but we see that expansion uh, across the board, really. So I want to stop here and let Kate continue with uh, this look into the outcomes, impacts, and so on. Kate, over to you. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. As Joanna says, it's um, really interesting for us to get the opportunity to, to talk to all of you and to learn how this phenomenon um, is impacting um, the world in which you, you operate on a daily basis. So, as Joanna said, I'm going to focus um, on three things, really, in, in my part of the presentation. Firstly, I want to talk a little bit about the outcomes of climate cases and about the impacts that cases are having. And, and here I'll draw heavily on some of the analysis in the Global Trends 2023 report. Then I want to talk a little bit about work we've started to try and do with colleagues at the Grantham Research Institute to understand how financial markets are responding to uh, this phenomenon uh, and ways in which um, uh, climate litigation risk might uh, start to impact um, on financial markets, perhaps in quite unpredictable ways. 
Uh, and then finally, I want to kind of draw um, in how the climate cases that we see, particularly in Europe, might interact with new climate legislation. Many of you will know that the European Union in the last year or two years has discussed uh, a huge range of new um, legislation that would have significant environmental climate sustainability um, impacts. So starting with the, the outcomes and the impacts, in, in the report, we, we draw this distinction. We say, you know, you can assess a case based on its outcome, what actually happens in the courtroom, what the judge orders, um, or you can assess uh, the impacts, the consequences of the case. And we do a piece of analysis on that first part, on outcomes, where we look at all of the um, 550 cases from outside of the US that have had some kind of decision issued. And we identify that more than 50%, it's about 54% of those cases, have outcomes that are favorable to climate action. So um, this is a, a really diverse set of cases and the outcomes can be as diverse as allowing a new set of climate arguments to proceed to trial uh, to uh, you know, a new order saying that a government needs to increase its ambition or as Joanna was talking about in the Milieu de Fancy and Shell case that a major multinational needs to uh, reduce its scope one, two and three emissions. And so we can see that there is this sort of broad trend um, in favor of uh, climate cases having positive outcomes, but that doesn't tell us so much. One way to learn more about what's actually happening is to then look at the impacts. And we can divide these again into direct impacts and indirect impacts. So the direct impacts are what actually happens as a result of orders in cases. And here, if we look at the government framework cases that Joanna was telling us about, we can see some really significant changes in policies that have been introduced to try and comply with court judgments that have been issued against governments. So, for example, in France, there was a successful challenge to um, France's a uh, suite of climate policies that was designed to meet its interim targets. Uh, and the court assessed those as being insufficient to meet the legislative targets and has ordered the government to come back um, to the court and present more ambitious policies. One round of policies has been presented, that has also been found lacking, and the court has ordered the government to come back with yet more policies um, to address this um, uh, gap that it sees. So we do see these direct impacts that have quite profound implications for shaping uh, the sort of transition policy environment um, that uh, different actors uh, have to respond to. But where it really gets interesting, in my view, is the indirect impacts. So we know that um, climate change litigation is starting to shape media narratives about climate change and questions about justice. It's having a big influence on public opinion. It's influencing policymakers even when they're not directly being litigated against and they don't have the threat of a court order against them precisely. And one way in which it's starting to do this is by amplifying financial risks associated with climate change um, and potentially increasing uh, those financial risks. So this is what led to um, our, our research with colleagues at the Grantham Institute into the impacts that climate litigation has on financial markets. We've set out to try and understand the impacts that litigation is having on financial market actors, working with economists at the Grantham Research Institute. And the first sort of output of this new research agenda is a working paper that we published earlier this year, where we used an event study methodology to try and understand what happens when a climate case is filed against a company to the company's um, share price, and also what happens when there is a decision against a company. Now, that question of decisions is a little bit trickier for us to assess because there aren't very many because this is such a new phenomenon. But nonetheless, the preliminary results of our research suggest that um, when a climate case is filed against a company, or when there's a decision um, that allows a case to proceed, or a, a decision like the case in the uh, decision in the Milieu de Fancy and Shell case, overall these have a small but st statistically significant impact on share prices. We find an average of uh, about negative 4.1. Uh, 
0.41%, sorry, um, and that is higher for carbon majors, so higher for uh, oil and gas companies that you might expect to be subject to more litigation. Um, it's also uh, higher when we are talking about negative decisions for companies, although, as I've said, there aren't so many of those, so the power of the test is weaker. Um, and interestingly, to my mind, we found that there was very little effect before 2019. So all of the impacts that we see are very recent, um, which I think aligns with, you know, what um, Chiara was talking about at the beginning, uh, you know, the awareness of this phenomenon, the increase in um, sort of engagement with this as an aspect of climate governance uh, that Joanna mentioned as well. So moving on then to um, legislation, this is the last thing I, I'd like to talk about. What we see from, I think, this preliminary research is that um, climate cases can have significant impacts on financial markets. And we can imagine that if there's a su successful case against a company that has a major damages award, that could really have um, produced quite a big shock. Um, and, and one of the concerns that many people have raised is that this is quite a disruptive uh, approach to the transition. It would be far better to have a level playing field and a sense that all companies have to, to comply with the same kinds of um, requirements uh, and there aren't things being imposed by courts in one country that aren't being imposed by courts in another country. And this, I think, is where EU legislation comes in as a really um, important and significant phenomenon that can um, help to address some of the um, concerns around climate litigation as a governance tool and that sort of disruptive um, influence that it can have, um, but which also might lead to more cases, just different kinds of cases. So we produced a, a report in March of this year looking at what new climate laws in Europe mean for the courts. And we assessed both the Fit for 55 package, which is the sort of flagship um, European um, legislative package aimed at um, implementing the European climate law, uh, as well as a number of other um, pieces of legislation uh, that go alongside that. And I think the Fit for 55 package, the kind of key message from that is that because that is a package of legislation that imposes many new kinds of climate targets on EU member states, it's likely to really shape the future of those government framework cases. So we can see, imagine cases trying to um, require countries to implement those targets. We may also see challenges to the ambition of those targets and whether they're sufficient um, in terms of the science. And the other thing we can imagine from that um, policy package is a potential increase in the just transition cases that Joanna mentioned earlier. We know that overall that um, uh, suite of legislation is anticipated to have a regressive impact if we don't have enough complementary policies to address um, some of the distributional effects of that. We could see uh, cases in court starting to challenge um, those new laws. But that's not the only piece of European legislation that's relevant here. We also see uh, the EU looking at legislation against uh, that will affect companies in the way that they operate. We see a number of pieces of legislation that might impact this phenomenon of climate washing or greenwashing litigation. I don't want to get into that so much, but hopefully by clarifying what companies um, can say, what information they must provide, we see a level playing field and, and companies having the confidence to, to make statements and know that they can stand behind them. I think the one that's really important is the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, which is currently being discussed um, by the EU legislators. And this um, has the potential to incorporate into EU law many of the business and human rights principles that have been so critical in the corporate framework cases, uh, which are right aligning 1.5 degrees. That's um, oh, sorry. I'm getting a bit of interference. Can you still hear me? Great. Um, so I'll, I'll just wrap up what I was saying um, uh, and then pass on. Uh, so the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, which will in incorporate some of the business and human rights principles we've seen used in um, some of the corporate framework cases that Joanna was discussing, like Milieu de Fonci and Shell, 
into EU law could have a big influence on the future of that kind of litigation uh, here in Europe. Um, we could see if uh, the, the legislation is clear enough in terms of creating mandatory transition obligations and plans, a decrease in that kind of litigation because we'll have a clearer level playing field, or if the, that piece of legislation ends up with um, sort of carve out some compromises that obscure um, some aspects of, of what was originally intended, we could see actually more litigation um, as uh, civil society groups try and compensate for, for some of what they would perceive as deficiencies. Um, so I'm happy to discuss that further. Um, uh, and for now, I'll, I'll stop talking and, and pass over to the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for your presentation, uh, Joanna and Catherine. And uh, well, I would have already some questions, but I think it is best to now pass the floor to our discussant. And I think Jean was the first one. Uh, Jean, please. Many, uh, many thanks, uh, Chiara, for uh, for the invitation, and and, and thanks to uh, uh, Catherine and, and Joanna for uh, for the, the presentation. I mean, it's it's very indeed. What you are, what you've presented is something that uh, you catch the uh, the eye of uh, the supervisory community and and got us started to to think. Um, if I'm fully honest uh, with you, it it, it got the uh, the the legal eye of uh, our previous chair uh, started started thinking. Uh, and in a nutshell, I, I think what you are doing is that uh, what you are saying is that uh, what you do, uh, what you don't do, what you say uh, matters. Uh, and it matters more than than what you what you think, and it matters especially if you if what you do does not match uh, what you what you say. Um, my, I would have uh, three remarks. Uh, um, first, uh, on on um, the type of cases you highlighted. I mean, you you clearly um, show that the the biggest trend is uh, a litigation towards sovereigns and public entities. Uh, the second one is toward NFCs, and the third one is toward uh, uh, financial institutions. Uh, and in fact, if you look at it at face value like that, uh, you, you can just say, okay, well, no big deal for a financial supervisor. Uh, and my, my, that would be my, my first point. Uh, why do we look at it? Uh, what's obvious is, let me start in reverse. Uh, when, when you start with the financial institution, it's everything that has to do with uh, with greenwashing, uh, but also on the other side, and you mentioned it uh, with the uh, anti sg lawsuits and so on. Uh, this relates to conduct, and this is something that uh, uh, we as supervisor already uh, um, know we should look at, uh, um, no matter what. Uh, where the thing is becoming a bit more interesting is when we look at the uh, the other ones and we start uh, thinking about the potential implications. Uh, so, looking at the NFCs, the corporates, what's quite clear is that uh, uh, the, the litigation is somehow a, li a liability being passed on to someone else. Uh, there, there, there was a loss or there was uh, a damage to someone and, um, and this is being passed on to someone and this end up, end up with someone uh, whom you did not expect initially uh, to bear this, uh, this liability. And it can come from actual damages. And here I have maybe my favorite example, which is uh, the, the PG&E example. Uh, the fact that uh, the wildfire in, in California, uh, uh, PG&E was uh, found liable for playing a role into uh, igniting, igniting uh, them. And uh, this eventually uh, uh, ended up <clears throat> in, a, in a chapter 11 for, for PG&E. So, I mean, if people tell you that uh, if people tell you that uh, that uh, um, climate litigation is is not something that will matter, well, in fact, we already have a track record of uh, um, cases where uh, somehow uh, you can say it was related to climate change uh, because yes, climate change is not the only culprit there, but but it's playing a role. It's making this uh, this type of uh, of damage is more probable. Um, and, and where we, we have seen something that is that was complete, completely value destructive. Uh, the other type of um, I think the other type of uh, liabilities for uh, is, is uh, liabilities in with regard to non-compliance, non-compliance with laws uh, and, and various types of uh, of this of, of regulations. 
And there again, uh, I think we are not, uh, and that's what your study is, is highlighting, we're not in a world where this would be inconsequential. Uh, I mean, we, we, we can expect uh, some uh, decision that would have, a, that would have a, a bigger impact. Let me come back to the first point that you, that you raised and that initially we thought mm, this is maybe not very significant for us. Uh, the case around the case against uh, sovereign. Indeed, the, 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 the implication, the financial, the direct financial implication of these cases might be, I would say, limited or um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a political signal. It's something like that, where we think that it is playing a role and we, we should pay attention is that this is clearly raising the transition risks. If we keep on having sovereigns uh, being uh, being found liable for not acting enough uh, toward climate change, definitely uh, climate action will, uh, will will become more aggressive. Uh, and at some point, it's, it's good that everyone gets ready for this change in the overall atmosphere, I would, I would say. So definitely, whichever type of case you look at, uh, this is something that is informing us uh, or that has, a, that has a risk dimension that is worth uh, paying attention to. Uh, Maybe one footnote, and that would be my short second point, is that uh, sometimes it's presented this litigation risk is, is is presenting as some kind of new risk that people uh, that people did not uh, uh, pay attention to. On the NGFS side, we uh, we have discussed that uh, a bit, and basically the common understanding is that. This is not something that we would put on on par with uh, the physical risk or transition risks, but clearly it's a channel that uh, would play uh, and would come to play in uh, uh, both categories of uh, of risk. Basically, this is a risk driver uh, uh, that that can matter and, and that do matter uh, in uh, in each of the risk uh, in each of the risk uh, categories. And my third and last point is with regard to okay now. We know uh, why we should look at it. We know uh, we know how to speak about it, but uh, what do we or, or how do we look at it, and what do we what do we do with it? Um, very honestly, uh, the, the the community, and I, I would mean that as being the uh, uh, private sector as well as the supervisory co uh, community, is is really early stage in, in understanding the implication of all this. And also an important dimension is that a lot of these cases are still ongoing litigations. So we don't know how the, uh, which, which side uh, the, the coin will, uh, will fall. Let me emphasize the glass, the glass half empty. Uh, this is being very politely or speaking very politely a very emerging issue, which means that at best uh, it's a footnote on something that uh, people are, are definitely putting on the to-do list for tomorrow or the day after tomorrow maybe. Let me look, it, look, look at it the, uh, the other way around. Uh, what this means also is, is that it's not too late to get on top of it because b before it is material to the, to the financial uh, sector. And that brings me to, to the very last uh, um, uh, things I have in mind in, in reading um, uh, your report and, and, uh, and, and during your presentation. Um, what is happening and how to, how to act before it is too, before it is too late? The first thing is that the supervisor can, should, and have clarified that it is part of, it is part of the supervisory expectation. When you look at the NGFS reports that Chiara mentioned, even the first one that uh, that she uh, she uh, uh, contributed to uh, to bring together, uh, this is clearly something that the supervisory community is aware of and is is, is uh, calling attention to. Uh, but also when you look at the BCBS, you look at the FSB, this is something that, that clearly is on the radar. And policy-wise, uh, this is something, for example, that is part of the supervisory expectation that the SSM has, has put out in, uh, in, in Europe. So clarify that it is part of, uh, of uh, the supervisory expectation. And among the NGFS members, you would, you would have some that would say that, well, this is enough. I mean, this is our role to call attention onto that. We, we are not meant to provide uh, the, the way people should look at it. Uh, that, that's for them to uh, basically to, to come up with and, and, and then we'll engage based on what they, they would have, uh, they would have uh, devised. Um, 
the report that uh, the, the report from the working group on supervision that basically uh, followed up the work of the uh, um, the uh, expert network on legal issues uh, proposes somehow a, a, a two step approach to uh, to that because maybe it's good to to know how to start uh, the discussion the first one is really to consider jurisdiction by jurisdiction have a materiality assessment of the of the cases in the various jurisdictions maybe if you are a supervisor in some place I would not name. Maybe this should not be your prime concern. Maybe, maybe among competing priorities, um, this is not something that you should you should bother uh, uh, much. Not not that it is not important, but this is maybe less important to you than than other other things. But once you have done that, and we are pretty confident that in a number of jurisdictions you would find that it is that it is material, uh, then it is it is to engage into an entity level uh, assessment to understand what is the capacity what is the capability of the uh, of the um, of the entity of the supervised entity and eventually i mean if you uh, follow or if you read in between the lines of of uh, of this conclusion basically uh, what we are saying is that maybe it's something that belongs to the world of pillar 2 in the banking uh, in the banking uh, sector um, that is the 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 way um, the uh, institutions are able to uh, to address a number of questions, not necessarily uh, uh, something that is completely quantitative, but something that is uh, qualitative. Uh, that 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 most probably will to be take, taken into account in in, uh, in, in reviewing, uh, so to speak, the uh, the capabilities profile of the uh, of the um, of the institutions. My final point as a conclusion, uh, you are speaking about climate litigation, and that's uh, a very important topic. I think litigation would have an even more uh, stronger and uh, disrupting role to play uh, when it comes to uh, other nature related, uh, other nature related development. Uh, there are other um, environmental uh, um, concerns. That's the translation of, I mean, the translation of which uh, will, go, will go through the court uh, more often than, than, than the climate ones. So I think what we are learning collectively about climate uh, is something that will be, uh, that will be useful uh, also in, in looking at the various dimensions of the environmental crisis. Thank you uh, uh, so much. And Chiara, that was my remarks. Thank you very much, Jean. So let's listen to Bernard. Bernard has uh, uh, some very interesting things to tell us as well. Please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chiara, for the invitation and uh, Katharina and Joanna for the presentation indeed. And that's a really uh, important emerging topics. Uh, and it's great to have this resource, which uh, again will be useful for us, Standard and Poor's as a great rating agency. And before talking about how we view and assess climate litigation uh, from a create rating perspective, I'd like to do a brief reminder of what is a create rating and what it is not. Uh, so just a create rating is a forward-looking opinion on create worthiness, which means it assess a niche where existing and future capacity and willingness to timely honor its financial commitment. So it's a time, what we measure is the ability of an entity to pay. It measures what we call create mentality not stakeholder materiality, i.e. the impact that an entity has on another stakeholder or on climate change. Stakeholder materiality, you know, the impact that an entity has on climate change uh, and create materiality are interrelated, but these relationships can vary in magnitude and over time, i.e. the fact that you have an impact uh, on climate does not automatically uh, trigger an impact on your create ratings, although it's relevant. And I think climate litigation is a bit in the middle of that. Uh, coming to climate litigation and the finding from your reports, you know, uh, just for us to tell you, for the past few years, we have identified climate litigation as an emerging risk uh, that we expect to grow in importance uh, and on which we published already some research in 221, just to say that it's something that we've been looking at. Uh, but Jean mentioned emerging risk, we'd agree it's an emerging risk. And uh, yes, what you saw is that yeah, it started in the US, became bigger, as you mentioned, started in terms of scope to touch multiple geography. We see it in Bulgaria, China, Russia, but you know, US was really the starting, then Europe type of entity. It spread across, as you mentioned, for private sector governments, sector of activity, indeed, as you say, the majority, uh, let's say, are still in oil and gas and energy, but now uh, we believe that, you know, 
almost every uh, stakeholder uh, sectors uh, can be uh, can be impacted. And indeed, uh, as you said, uh, when you look at there is also big and increasing diversity in terms of type of climate, you know, between the line outcome, non-aligned non outcome, you know, in with the EG backlash in the US, the type of legal arguments. So things are really uh, evolved. Uh, we agree indeed, and we see that, that there already had some metal impact, direct or indirect, on climate change decision making. You know, you mentioned number, but you know, Germany raising its decarbonation targets uh, following the 221 constitutional court ruling was also quite an interesting case for us. Uh, and also, you know, on the other side, what's happening in the in the US, where you know, the fear of climate litigation um, related to potential antitrust behaviors led to a number of insurers uh, uh, fleeing the net zero insurance islands. So saying that, you know, climate litigation or the fear of climate litigation can lead uh, to impacts. Uh, and we believe that now high meeting activities are much more likely to be challenged at different points in their life cycle from initial financing to final project approval. One point to note probably when we think about climate litigation and reputation risk, is that it can lead to unintended consequences, i.e., when you think about climate litigation uh, and climate litigation risk, it can indeed lead entities, if you're saying for pro-climate, to enhance their policies and strategy. But conversely, what we've seen already also is that the risk of climate litigation uh, can also uh, has pushed some entities to reduce their climate disclosure and also avoid making some public commitments that could be challenged. Considering that currently, I think everybody needs to be aware that we are operating in a world where data integrity, comprehensiveness is uh, not, uh, is, has yet to make a lot of progress, in particular with regard to scope free, and which means that making any commitment uh, quantitative commitments to uh, scope free, which we believe is best practice, also expose you to potential to be a target of challenge because the ability to measure in a consistent way across institution and across time scope free currently, I would say, is a real challenge. If not, it's really, really difficult. So that's just an unintended consequence of that which uh, needs to be taken into consideration. Now, in the, how do we assess litigation risk from a critical perspective? Uh, clearly, we look at both the direct and indirect costs. Uh, how much is an issuer spending on the, on the case? Uh, that how much a penalty could an issuer absorb, assuming unfavorable outcome? Uh, important questions for us are not only the magnitude of the penalty, or, but also how the penalty could be structured. How many years to pay? How many years to implement the business and strategic implications? But we, the second is reputational risk. You know, in case what would be the consequence of a high-profile litigation on the corporation uh, across its stakeholders? You know, what could be uh, consumer reactions, investor reactions, provider of finance? Would they be well willing to do business with the company? What about the entity ability to attract and retain its talents? Uh, how could that in, uh, affect the entity competitive position and overall business risk profile compared to its peers or in absolute? So these are the type of questions we may ask ourselves. Now, uh, if we look at today, and Jean mentioned pg &E, uh, which is a great example, I would say that we we did not uh, we did not consider it strictly as a climate litigation although i would completely agree that you know these white fire have been highly facilitated by the maybe global warming but if we set aside the the case of pg e we've not identified uh rating actions for which climate litigation risk itself or climate litigation outcome was the primary driver uh, the hurdle for a credit rating change, um, knowing that, you know, you mentioned share price, you know, uh, credit rating change are, let's say, are, have a bigger hurdle. And there are too many reasons for that. Uh, corporations being sued tend to be large and diversified, which means their ability to address the consequence of a single climate litigation without undermining their overall credit worthiness can be high. You know, climate litigation is one factor 
among multiple other great factors, which speaks to your financial flexibility, the diversification of your business, your ability to take out different measures, which limit the uh, impact of climate litigation. The, the second one is that it's currently still quite difficult. There are many hurdles in translating litigation risk into our create analysis. One of the biggest hurdles is the high degree of uncertainty in how and when a case may eventuate, as I was mentioning. You know, outcomes are highly variable, depend on factors related to jurisdictions, the nature of the claims, the trends of legal arguments, and the willingness of parties to settle or appeal. If you take the case of you know uh, climate major climate events um, and the claim for loss and damage, uh, the, there is a challenge to prove the causal link between the defendant action uh, or inaction and the extraordinary climate event taking place. So there is a level of uncertainty, a difficulty to prove the claim and the causality, which um, and this uncertainty extends to the magnitude of penalties. The issue of timing also is very important. Beyond, as I was mentioning, understanding the timeline of the outcome, when will this uh, legal proceeding will end and some will go to appeal and then, you know, will continue uh, up to the end and the extent to which the timeline, there will be a timeline associated with any penalty. Uh, you know, for example, a company may be able to absorb a large judgment against it without significant deterioration in its financial metrics if that penalty is to be spread across a great number of years. So there is, uh, as of today, the, the, the huge magnitude of uncertainty surrounding the final outcome of the ongoing uh, climate litigation taking place leads us to typically uh, mention the case, describe it, follow it, but not take action because the there are too many uncertainties to really uh, uh, take you know, uh, actions at this stage. One thing to, to keep in mind is that, you know, if we think about climate, um, the fact that net zero commitments taken at sovereign level in the absence of specific regulation, translating them into new regulatory constraint uh, applying to specific legal entities or sectors, these, these, legal, these, these legal commitment taken by sovereign, by sovereign have limited, uh, if no, legal consequences for the economic actors. Um, the case, just to come back to them, uh, we also noticed, you know, the, I mentioned Germany, but the case against sovereigns, which have led to an increase in transition ambition, uh, you know, we have somehow increased transition risk with the risk to, the more you transition rapidly, the more you, you create potential disruption uh, in the economic sectors. But this has not been at a level which has led, would have led us to change either a sovereign rating or, or ratings across the corporate or financial service sector in the given, uh, in the given jurisdictions. Now, from this viewpoint, the ongoing increase in sustainability related regulations, including disclosure requirements, uh, you can also think about 345 corporate sustainability due diligence directive, which was mentioned. Uh, all these, you know, this flurry of new regulation will create new related climate, climate uh, legal obligations and associated potential litigation risk. So, whereas we do not anticipate at this stage a short-term change in the climate litigation materiality, which means that it's, it's currently relatively limited, even if they have, you have an element of event risk, you know, if one uh, legal process will, was to end up in something really major and disruptive, uh, that could lead us to review, uh, you know, our approach. But so far, we've not seen a case which really led us to think that, you know, this would lead to major disruptions. So even if we don't believe that there would be any short-term change in crit mentality, it's really an area that we are uh, following as it evolves and uh, and we are really caref careful to continue assessing and reassessing the extent to which the both the direct and indirect impacts of this climate litigation are going to move forward. We we believe really that this is something which now is part, you know, of the business environment and you could say that's sovereign, you know, the overall environment and that its credit mentality could one day spark spike in an unexpected way, you know, uh, could be by 
higher financial penalties. You know, we so far it's been quite difficult uh, to prove the causality and get damage, or it's been just on one file. Could they be one day, you know, uh, in the same way uh, which you see legal proceeding against tobacco companies or you know uh, large cases with multiple? Could it take place one day? It's a possibility. Or cases leading to accelerated uh, and more disruptive transition. I, in terms of as you call them, framework types of cases, either at corporate and and sovereign level. So these are really for us areas to watch, um, and that's why again your study is so uh, important. But not yet having, let's say, a significant impact on our credit ratings. And at this stage, that's the end of my remarks. Thank you very much, Bernard. If you agree, Joanna and Catherine, I would then move to Alex and we then give you the floor to reply. Uh, Alex, please. Thank you very much, Chiara. And thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak and to uh, Joanna and Catherine for the fantastic presentation and indeed to the, the other discussants. So I'm going to confine my comments to looking, looking at banks and, and specifically uh, looking forward. As we've heard, although the numbers are increasing all the time, uh, climate litigation is very much in its infancy. And so I think it makes sense to, 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 to take that lens. And obviously, when thinking about banks, um, one can look at uh, climate litigation risk through, through two lenses. The first being the indirect risk that banks face as a result of climate litigation posed to, to their clients. And the second being the direct risk they face by climate litigation um, posed to them directly. And I'll make a few points about each. So regarding the indirect risks, hearing what Joanna and, and Catherine have had to say, um, I, I take, and, and obviously reading their, their fantastic work, I take, um, I guess, two key trends from the growing number of cases against corporates that, that banks may be exposed to. The first is that there's a, an increase in, in cases uh, that, that, they, that Joanna set out as being polluter pays cases. Um, so cases seeking damages related to firms' historic or ongoing contributions to, to climate change. And secondly, there being an emergence of uh, framework cases, as, as Joanna put it. So cases seeking uh, court orders that firms align their business with the Paris Agreement temperature objectives. And the best example being Louis de Fancy and Shell which as has been raised, I believe, the Dutch court uh, ordered Shell to cut its scope one to three emissions by 2030, by 45%, sorry, by 2030 relative to, to 2019. And some cases asked for both, um, as Mania and Holcim, which Joanna references, is one example where the claim is asked for both. And, and looking at those cases from, from a bank's perspective, the first point I would make is that really just reinforcing that an order from a court requiring a firm um, particularly an oil and gas firm or a coal firm at this moment in time, to align with the Paris Agreement is likely to be transformational, given where many firms are in, in the stages of their climate transition journey. And the handbrake turn in business strategy that's likely to be needed as a result of such a court order uh, is likely to generate um, a lot of stranded asset risks and potentially risks to the viability of the firm. And I know in this regard, a speech by, by Frank Elderson recently, where he said that um, risk to uh, a company's viability resulting from such rulings is, is broadly, resulting from such rulings, I should say, and, and potential unexpected adaptation costs or, or stranded asset risks uh, broadly has not been priced in. So I would, I would just highlight that first of all. And the second point is, is, again, perhaps an obvious one, but if the dominoes begin to fall, in the polluter pays cases against carbon majors, if precedents are established, if it becomes accepted that the polluter should pay in relation to climate change, well then, as the NGFS has pointed out before, the scale of climate-related damages to be suffered is likely to be huge. And so if firms are responsible even for a small proportion of those damages, one judgment of itself could be, again, a significant risk and banks exposed to such firms um, will have significant material uh, risk to manage in, in, in that regard. Um, so, so I'd make those two points, um, first of all, and, and also just to, just to point out that it's not impossible to imagine that um, a court order requiring 
a Paris line transformation for one or a number of firms in a particular sector could contribute to a, a widespread reevaluation of the value of that sector and the companies and assets within it. And, you know, here at Client Earth, we certainly um, think often about the size of the fossil fuel bubble, the kind of carbon intensive bubble. And who's to say that one or a number of these cases couldn't be the catalyst for the kind of systemic downturn that the Bank de France and the Bank for International Assessments were writing about in their Green Swan report uh, a few years ago. Um, so obviously a managed transition would be preferable and um, clearly laws of the kind that Catherine was speaking about, the EU Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive that can create a level playing field for the transition can, it, it, that's obviously, those laws are obviously a preferable option to this kind of court-led, um, court-order-led transition. And so um, I would particularly, um, particularly pleased to note that um, the trial laws are coming up regarding, regarding the, the EU's um, corporate sustainability diligence law. And I would certainly advocate for the financial sector's inclusion so it can play a role in the transition of the real economy and thereby the financial sector and the banking sector can can mitigate their own their own risk profiles because ultimately exposures to companies that, that are implementing a Paris line transition plan ultimately that's going to be the best defense for for, for a bank um so so those are the remarks i would make about the indirect climate litigation risk posed to to banks regarding the the direct risks posed to the banking sector which haven't really been um discussed in depth uh, so far, I wouldn't say in, in, in many forums, but I would say based on emerging trends, uh, which I will come to, banks are exposed to material climate litigation risks directly. And in terms of those trends, the first I would point to is that there has been a spate of cases under the French duty of vigilance law, um, which is a similar in nature, I suppose, to the EU Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive in that it requires companies to identify and mitigate environment and climate related human rights uh, impacts in their value chains and take steps to address those impacts. And, and under that law, there are now three cases targeting BNP Paribas and other French banks including one filed in February by uh, Notre Affair too and, and Les Amis de la Terre France and other French NGOs, which essentially alleges that BNP Paribas um, due diligence plan is insufficient, is deficient, because it fails to include a commitment to terminate financing for companies developing fossil fuel projects. And so you can begin to see that the trend in cases asking courts to require uh, real economy firms to align with Paris is beginning to come to the banks as well. And just as with real economy firms, such an order, again, BNP Paribas, these cases I've referenced are still in progress, but such an order could be transformational, again, for the banking sector. The second development I want to point to uh, is that of the UN's human rights experts writing in June of this year to 10 major global banks regarding those banks continued financing of and support for Saudi Aramco, the world's largest emitter. And the letters essentially confirm that under international human rights standards, specifically the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, a bank bears responsibility for the climate related human rights impacts of its value chain, including those that are occurring as a result of fossil fuel expansion, the exploitation of uh, new fossil fuel assets and also greenwashing. And the letters also confirmed that a bank can move along a continuum from being directly linked by virtue of its financing relationship with a real economy firm to contributing uh, in, in UNGP language and UN guided principle language to climate related human rights impacts um, where they have enabled, encouraged or motivated the relevant human rights impacts. And for a bank, um, we allege in our complaint and the U.S. less severe to confirm that contribution territory can be reached if that bank, if any bank, fails to um, use its leverage uh, to align its client, clients with the Paris Agreement and certainly um, pressuring them to cease fossil fuel expansion. Um, so that's, uh, and, that, and that's critical, that, that, that move, that potential move, that 
acknowledgement that banks can be in contribution territory through inaction vis-a-vis -vis their fossil fuel clients is critical because under the UN guiding principles, so under international human rights soft law, um, contribution to human rights impacts comes with a commensurate responsibility to engage in the remedy of those impacts. And that's critical because through this, through these arguments, through these legal arguments that are likely to be deployed in national courts, you can essentially end up with banks being accountable for the climate related damages caused by their clients. And returning to my earlier point, the scale of those damages is such that that legal link would be financially material for, for banks. And Frank Elderson, again, I return to the same speech he made earlier this year to the ECB legal conference. He said that it's not impossible that soon litigants will go for the jugular with regard to the banks, whereby they could argue that banks have a duty of care under civil law to protect fundamental rights by reducing their own finance emissions in line with Paris and by immediately stopping the financing of new fossil fuel exploration. So that, that, that's the second of my, my, my key points. And the third briefly is that we are beginning to see in Australia uh, cases against banks by shareholders regarding their deficient or non-implementation of, of an effective house line transition strategy. Just last week, you had an Australian NGO representing a shareholder of ANZ Bank, um, which brought an action in the Federal Court of Australia com to compel the handover of documents relating to the bank's management of climate change and biodiversity loss. And seemingly, the catalyst for that action was the bank's um, continued high levels of financing of, of fossil fuels uh, compared to its competitors in particular. Um, so that, that's, that's the key point I would make on that point and, and just summing up i think what, what we're seeing is that the increasing amount of cases against carbon majors seeking to hold them to a paris aligned 1.5 degree transition strategy via a court order or via um, the need to provide compensation for damages that is a trend that is increasingly posing material legal risk to banks because of their exposure to those clients because of the potential for such orders to have a material impact on those firms, businesses, and of the sectors in which they operate. So reverberating out into the sectors and potentially causing not just counterparty risk, but systemic risk that banks should be aware of. And in terms of the direct risks, I think we're seeing that the courts are going to be increasingly likely to be asked to step in to require that banks um, restrict their financing to companies in carbon intensive sectors with a Paris line transition plan. Um, the courts are gonna be asked to hold banks accountable where they fail to restrict their financing in such way and where they are clearly contributing to a client's climate related impacts by, by not using their leverage to move the client into Paris alignment. Uh, and thirdly, that shareholders are likely to be allowed to step in or, or at least likely to try to step in to hold banks accountable for um, any failure to have or implement a progress line transition plan. And whilst these cases are all in their infancy, um, and the outcomes are obviously unclear from, from Werner's perspective, the trend is clear. And so I think the legal risk for banks is clear. And there's certainly enough evidence that those legal risks could translate into material financial impact. And just to return to my point, obviously, a managed transition in accordance with laws, particularly um, what we call mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence laws of the kind that the CSEEE is, is preferable. And so if you're, a, if, if you're a supervisor thinking about a bank's exposure to climate litigation, I would certainly encourage a, um, a showing of support for such laws and the financial sector's inclusion within them and their inclusion as the EACSEEE does of a mandatory provision requiring Paris line transitions in the real economy and in the banking sector. Um, and those are my, those are my opening re re remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, really fascinating, uh, present number of presentations. So, um, uh, Joanna, Catherine, would you like to pick here and there on some of the issues that were raised? Thank you. These reactions were extremely rich and uh, I, I really enjoyed the different angles that were covered so many uh, important uh, 
uh, issues have been raised. I want to make two quick points. Uh, the first um, is just a clarification and uh, answers to a question in the chat about the growth of litigation against corporates. So uh, just in terms of clarification, I think it's important to keep in mind that the majority of the litigation is still against governments. Uh, if you look outside of the US, but also in the US, it is really the vast majority. We're talking about 80% of cases against uh, governments. The cases against corporates do uh, have uh, quite a lot of visibility and that links to, I think, a point that was made by Jean in terms of the reputational aspect. Uh, corporates suffer more this reputational uh, damage or risk from, from the litigation and, and there's been a lot of coverage. But in terms of sheer numbers, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that um, it's still mostly litigation against governments. So that's just a clarification, but um, it links to, I think, one point that I want to make, which is um, re regarding the, the three types of risk that we talk about in Mark Carney's speech in 2015. And um, I think it, it does bring together a lot of what I heard from, from the different commentators. So uh, there is an interesting discussion about how to understand those risks. If it's, we, we have two risks, transition risk and physical risk and the litigation or liability would be a type of a transition, or if it's three risks, if it's called liability or litigation, it's interesting that there's still, um, of course, uh, not that's not unusual, but there's still a, a discussion on how to understand that uh, th those risks. But I think what is, to me, what I see happening now is that the litigation risk has been a, an accelerator of the other two and a way to materialize the other two. Um, and uh, so, for instance, the, fa the fact that uh, not only the, you see, if you think of a litigation creating new risks, but those risks creating litigation, you can see how that process of accelerating is not just one way, it's two ways. So it, it has the potential to really accelerate the other two and it can be considered therefore a risk in itself. So uh, li listening to Alex here, you know, how, how he was talking about the, 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 the direct and indirect risks and the, uh, and then back to uh, I, I think a point that Bernard made uh, about the uh, litigation against sovereigns, you really have a, a sense of how uh, the, the litigation translates a uh, concern of society in terms of how the pace has been slow, how uh, there, there are issues with the communication or the lack of the communication, uh, what uh, uh, Jean mentioned in terms of what you say, what you don't say and how you say. So it, it, it really uh, makes all of that evidence. So it's a very effective way to communicate insatisfaction or uh, these problems that uh, we see in, in governance, but then also then it creates new risks and something we haven't touched upon, but I think it's also important is that some of this litigation that then determines the state to, to say legislate, we spoke about the German case um, and, and other cases has also in itself resulted in further litigation. We're thinking now ISDS arbitration cases where then the state is being sued by the companies who are unhappy with uh, this for instance, phase out of coal that was determined also through the litigation, but uh, of course, uh, through the legislation. So I think it, the way I would sum up here is that um, even if um, I think Jean uh, brought this, that it's an emerging risk. Uh, yes, it's an emerging risk, but it's a, 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 an emerging risk that has emerged very quickly. If you think five years ago, very few people were would even consider we would never have had this uh, session here in SAF or the bank, uh, the ECB and other banks wouldn't be even considering this. The fact that there is this uh, uh, across so many sectors now a consideration, uh, uh, an explicit discussion, publications about this just confirms to me that uh, it's impossible to hide. So the emerging risk is uh, definitely much too big of an elephant that uh, now we, we do speak about it. The uh, attempts uh, to quantify or 
also uh, beginning to become um, more comprehensive and I think we still struggle and this was pointed by many uh, with the fact that so many cases are ongoing that a lot of the litigation builds upon it in uh, previous cases and importantly that even unsuccessful litigation can be an important precedent for new successful cases. There is a lot of building upon uh, one another. So I finish there and uh, I want again to thank you all for this opportunity and the really, really interesting uh, rounds of uh, comments and talks that we heard. Just to add to what Joanna has said, I want to pick up on this point about Climate litigation is an emerging risk and Bernard, you made the point that you're, you're watching it, but you don't yet, um, you know, think of it as something that will have an impact on how you're assessing credit ratings. I think there is a real question, which is, should the broader financial community, not necessarily ratings agencies, but should the broader financial community be waiting for that risk to manifest? before they start paying attention? Uh, or is it something where it may not be within the power of financial regulators to address the risks themselves, but by looking at the possibilities for mitigating the risk and engaging with other actors, there may still be mitigation strategies available. And so I think there we have to think about who are the actors that can mitigate some of these risks? Well, they are the firms that might be litigated, whether we're talking about banks, as, as Alex has just pointed out, as entities that could be subject to direct litigation, or whether we're talking about counterparty firms. And they are governments and legislatures that can clarify duties and obligations uh, in ways that address some of the sort of fundamental legal principles that have led to the success of the phenomenon of these cases, but in a way that allows for, um, you know, more consistency, more order in the way that these, these issues are addressed. So I do think there's a kind of fundamental question now about what should we do when this risk is at the emerging risk stage to try and prevent it from, uh, you know, emerging unchecked and, and leading to some of the dis disruption um, that uh, other participants have flagged as, as potentially um, uh, Ber out. Bernard has the answer for you. No, not the answer, <laughs> but just first a reaction, just besides. Uh, I say we do not currently have change ratings due to this. Uh, PAG is a special specific case. Uh, and we do not expect to change them in the short term. I'm not, I didn't use will not because I'm saying there is a lot of uncertainties surrounding this. What I could say is that the more we accumulate delays in transitioning, the higher the risk of litigation, which could trigger an acceleration, but a potentially disruptive to the transition. But I would say, so I see that as we are accumulating delays in transitioning, legal risk is increasing and could, as I mentioned, uh, eventually uh, lead to disruptive related to, I was talking about, you know, a very large uh, live, uh, process like litigation like happened against the tobacco companies. Uh, I've mentioned the uh, force acceleration in transition for a given company or for, so I think that the risk of disruption exists. There was a mention, and it's true. If you have one case somewhere where we say it can be replicated and we see that there is a legal then that could trigger uh, um, but it's a bit digital today you know either it's something which is pushed and we see that litigation is pushing for action and this is happening but it's not led to big disruptions and that's why we're saying it's uh it's having an impact but you know it's not it has not yet triggered something which would be really disruptive that was the message i was mentioning but it's possible that it could happen and if it was to happen some, somewhere and could be replicated, then you would get this, you know, reassessment of, of it. It might never, uh, it could, it's just that there are so many uncertainties and the more regulations we have, due diligence, directive, uh, sustainability regulation across, the more uh, there will be some legal um, tiffs uh, if people don't comply to these regulations. At the moment, you know, fiduciary, uh, duty, duty of care, whatever, how do you prove the causality? There are so many things which are and the direct uh, impact on an individual or group of individuals for future climate change. 
makes it you know full of uncertainties but we see it as an emerging growing risk just to mention and i wouldn't use will for the indefinite future for sure i was looking at alex i was thinking um joanna started answering this question on the um, movement from government cases to corporates uh, and she uh, basically explained this is not really true there is an increase in corporates but it's still um, against governments i was wondering alex you are uh, on on the strategic side on the other side uh, if you have uh, because i have an idea but i don't know if it is just my idea um, th th there is a reason in my view why uh, corporates are, are are challenged and it is uh, the publicity Joanna mentioned, but I think there are other reasons. I don't know, do you have a contribution here? You explain our your strategy? <laughs> uh, probably not in detail. Um, I have a, I guess I have a few thoughts. I think um, the first, the first and maybe main thing I would point to is that a lot of the world's most, a lot of the world's largest companies essentially have emissions footprints that are larger than most states and i would point to the richard heady study which is by now famous in climate litigation circles that finds that there's something like um i think something like 90 carbon majors are responsible for about 70 percent of all carbon emissions since since records began so i think that explains in part the leap from governments to corporates because you can squarely lay at the door of their activities a lot of the contribution to climate climate impact so, I mean, from my perspective, it was, it do, it's not surprising that once you had a case like agenda, which opened up the idea that there was a standard of care, a duty of care for governments to do more to mitigate climate impact, that that argument would lead to a corporate. And um, in my, from my perspective, the argument is, is increasingly going, likely to lead, lead to a bank as well. So I think that's probably my, my, my headline response. Um, I'll maybe stop there in, in light of time. Okay, my, my, my thought was, isn't it also because they have very big pocket, the state, of course, could also pay, but there is a conflict between different public interests, maybe, while, you know, if the company simply externalizes cost, everybody would agree they have to pay. I don't know. Yeah, I suspect, yeah, I suspect that's probably true as well, at least in the, in the eyes of the public, they're probably happier for Shell or, or any carbon major to pay than than the government to pay when ultimately the government's money will come from their their pockets yes. taxpayers so i think that probably is a pretty accurate as well time is getting short so i will still ask two questions uh we cannot take them all one for jean if you could elaborate a little bit about how supervisory authorities can ensure financial institutions are adequately considering this risk so what is the leverage and the leeway that we uh, can use as authorities highlighted it very well the uh, the challenges but also the reason and approaches that uh, that uh, uh, banks can can um, follow to uh, to address this risk i mean the way credit agencies are are doing it is basically the way anyone involved into a uh, credit provision uh, should uh, should uh, track it uh, in 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 my understanding really we we don't need to have anything more than what we have today uh, through pillar 2 typically uh, to go uh, to go see the bank and, and check uh, how they are uh, taking all of these uh, aspects into uh, into account. And I'd like to point the uh, the participant to a speech that uh, Frank Anderson just gave a few minutes ago. Uh, um, you know, providing a good example of uh, of ways a supervisors can uh, somehow um, whip, uh, so to speak, uh, the sectors into really focusing on 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 the uh, on, on what matters. And it's not because it is hard that uh, that we should not do it. I mean, typically the way we are collectively approaching that is that uh, um, uh, first, I mean, the, the first steps are important steps, and, and then let's improve and let's go faster. But but we need to uh, we need to keep moving in that respect. So I have no specific ideas about how to uh, how to do it in practice. But I think it's really for everyone to sit down and ask it, ask uh, 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 him or her, herself. Uh, okay, now that I need to do it, uh, how do I start this uh, this uh, this assessment? There is a disconnect between uh, some of the policies, some of the regulations, or some of the decisions, and the actual policies that, that are implemented, which basically are pushing people into uh, one direction. But the policies that are meant to uh, get us there uh, are not there. So th there is this disconnect. 
Uh, if this disconnect is resolved, I think there is no question, uh, really. Uh, the question is that if these disconnects are not resolved in the end, uh, what will happen? I don't know, but uh, I fear that this will be a, a place where uh, there will be some consequences and some risks that will, uh, that will materialize. So, I mean, I think uh, Jasper is right to point at the potential disconnect uh, there. I think it's too, 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 too early to say that it's, uh, it's really already a problem, but uh, it's definitely something that is worth keeping an eye on. And we are indeed keeping an eye on this. Thank you very much. So at least there is uh, an initial answer to that as well. So John and Katerina, Ernest uh, is wondering whether there is a fatigue and whether people are now getting tired, because according to the, uh, the chart you showed us, there has been a, a reduction of court cases. That is actually not my impression from what we see here, but I probably have a, a, a Eurocentric vision, maybe, maybe in other places it has diminished, but please. Um, look, uh, answering very quickly, it, it, it's too early to answer to this question. It, there is first of all, an issue with that data collection. So we could be, uh, and it happens often that we are finding cases that were filed in previous years now. Um, there could also be uh, political uh, situations, for instance, the US where there's a, a large number of cases being filed had a, a, a reactive to Trump litigation. So uh, a kind of a anti-deregulation uh, litigation that uh, was also, uh, probably responding, that was responding for a large number of cases. The same in Brazil, there was an anti-Bolsonaro litigation. These politicians move on and that there is less the need to an immediate response. But uh, I would say that overall, uh, it's still early to tell if uh, the cases are being exhausted. It doesn't look like, as Chiara said, there's still a lot of, I think, strategies, new cases, new decisions to come. I think we talked about laws coming in to fill in the gaps between climate cases, but but I think it could also work the other way around. Regulatory adverse regulatory decisions against any company or or financial sector participant could of themselves be um, a significant spark for further climate cases. And so, as policymakers respond to the phenomenon of climate change, I think it's likely that you're going to see um, increasing findings of wrongdoing by policymakers and regulators, and that of itself could be a significant additional spur for climate cases. And I just wanted to jump in and point point that out. Thank you very much, Alex. I think it was a fascinating discussion. I would just make, like to make two comments on two new trends that we are all witnessing. The first is the topic of funding uh, of uh, climate litigation. Uh, from our perspective, uh, we are, um, until now, we have seen that there were some, some limitation in the funding, which also brought to some limitation in the challenges brought to court. But this has been changing very quickly in the last uh, uh, month uh, or half a year. So now, first of all, we have states and government entering the game. So we have seen the California case against the four, the five uh, major uh, carbon uh, uh, polluter or producers. Um, also, last uh, month, you all saw this uh, huge uh, um, uh, litigation loan granted by a US uh, uh, hedge fund for environmental litigants. And of course, that shows that now environmental litigation is becoming a financial product and not only uh, an ethic and, uh, you know, uh, human right uh, issue. So that the only reflection is that this could change the scale of the game. And so the risk that banks um, and companies are subject to and states as well might really increase because it means uh, there are the resources to really push these things to the end. The second reflection is the um, addition to the climate litigation of biodiversity litigation and nature litigation. And um, here, uh, of course, the risk of losing bio, uh, the, ecosystem uh, the, the, the ecosystem services on which humanity relies is, is an enormous risk. And uh, uh, the litigants here are learning very fast from their experience with climate litigation and starting now to target all the same that were targeted before with climate, uh, state, public entities, corporation, but also financial institutions with this new uh, group of cases. And we have seen now very recently a challenge to Paribas, BNP Paribas, on uh, their impact on biodiversity loss and deforestation, which you could not have imagined, in my view, even maybe six months ago. 
So um, these are new areas of, of exploration for us. The area um, of li climate litigation is evolving extremely quickly, as the report that uh, Joanna and uh, Catherine have presented to us uh, shows, and we see new cases uh, continuously in basically in all the world. Um, so my plea to all those attending is to continue to collaborate in monitoring developments uh, in, in climate litigation, but also acting on them in our respective roles so that we are not found unprepared and that perhaps we manage also to diminish any way there is to all of us uh, coming from uh, climate uh, change and biodiversity loss. So sorry, but I wanted just to, to um, to put a bit of reflection as well, because to me, we need to continue uh, getting together and remaining in contact and reflecting on these issues. And I would like as very last thing to thank uh, you, Ernest, uh, for having organized uh, all this and brought all of, us, uh, all of us together because it has been extremely enriching. Thank you very much. This concludes our Swerf Buffy Bocconi Electron Global Trends in Climate Change Litigation. Thank you very much to Joanna and Catherine. To Jean, Alex, and Bernard, and particularly to you, Chiara, for sharing your knowledge with us and for the very lively discussion. And to all participants for your interest and for your many questions. Bye bye and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie, grazie mille. <laughs> Vielen Dank. Grazie. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao. 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 Ciao.